right. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing this late in the afternoon, nearing the end? Doing well? Come on. Make some noise. There we go. We have some energy left. All right. So I have a very exciting topic uh, to present today for you. Uh, I'll be talking about near and order devices. But first, let me tell you a bit about myself. Um, now, about six years ago, I was doing my bachelor's at UCL in London and really being interested in telecommunications, doing community wireless networks, being ham radio operator. I obviously studied something in that direction. And there I came up with the idea of building a wireless optical system. Now, this has nothing to do with LoRa or LPWAN, but it solves another problem in delivering high speed data. So at the time, um, I was trying to figure out how to build this cool hardware solution. Like, how do you even go about this, coming out of university and not having too much real world experience? Um, I was very fortunate uh, to be supported by the Shuttleworth Fellowship Program. And that enabled me to start Earnest and actually start the story of creating hardware in a new and efficient way. And for the first few years, we were really building Kuruza and wireless optical systems. And all of the, you know, LoRaWAN was really coming up at the time. These were hobby projects, you know, fun little things to do and play mostly in the spare time. But as we grew as a company, we started being really efficient in the development process. So we actually spun off Kuruza as a product. And we work on building new solutions as we find the process to be very, very efficient. So Today, actually, we run a development lab in Slovenia, and we build plenty of different cool devices, from hardware to electronics, and all integrated into applied solutions in multiple fields. So you may know uh, myself or some of our projects, as they were briefly mentioned uh, in the intro videos you've seen in the morning. You've seen the turtles swimming around. That was a really cool project we did with Aribada Initiative. Um, on building hardware that enables us to track sea turtles in very remote locations in the world, put either GPS trackers on it or put cameras on it for the purpose of understanding how these animals behave. So the problem we're solving is trying to understand how the environment affects the behavior of animals. And if they're super endangered, this is really, really important. So with the camera system on turtles, we were able to gather the data for our partners. Um, that managed to understand where they feed, where they swim, what plastic in the ocean they find. And that interaction is really, really important to understand so we can take proper measures. So this is technology in real life action, you know, saving turtles that are hundreds of years old, um, and there's not that many of them. Likewise, on the same aspect, uh, we worked on penguin monitoring. That is something that you can think of real-time data is lacking. So there's a few projects online. Uh, you might know Penguin Watch, uh, which is another really cool project. Basically, they put cameras on Antarctica that take photos of penguins. They go there by boat. They come back in a year, take the photos, stick them online, and then people click on penguins, and they're counted that way. The only issue with that is it's not real-time. Data is at least a year late, if not more, before someone clicks on that penguin and gets the result. And with that, so we built a camera system that's actually an edge computing platform, taking photos uh, and storing them on the SD card. That's the basic functionality. But what does LoRaWAN especially enable us to do in such super remote locations? Actually, with Lacuna Space, um, shout out to those guys. They're really bringing in some awesome connectivity everywhere in the world. We can use awesome you know, AI, TensorFlow, machine learning, you name it, on the device itself in super remote locations, process that, create a small chunk of data that we can actually send at low power, reliably, and at a low cost. And with that, we get real-time information. Last year, uh, I had a talk here about drone mapping. Some of you may recall that. We've looked at these remote areas. How do we actually roll out LoRaWAN networks efficiently? So we did that, and we came up with quite a cool solution in that case. So here's just a few examples of uh, what can happen. We do a bunch of other things as well, from 3D bioprinting, um, building hardware for tissue engineering, and some medical devices. And quite a bit of those things can have IoT technologies uh, included in that. Like even in the labs, they're becoming smarter and smarter, and they require more connectivity, 
tracking, and so forth. So this all very much applies. But today, I would really like to dive more into the water, to say so. Water is really in a lot of locations where we do work and where a lot of our partners and customers um, have questions. And they would like to resolve that questions in new and better ways. What LoRaWAN enables is to build more cost-effective solutions to increase the data density. Because sensors have been around for a long time. You have smart buoys, you have smart sensors. They were 2G connected, 3G connected, you name it. There has been a lot of that. But typically, those devices are big, chunky, and quite expensive. They produce very good data, but because of their cost, we do not get the scale. We don't get the data density. We may, we may have one data point, not 100. So if we look at this sketch of the world as we see it, to put it that way, on Antarctic USA, we have penguins. We can look at penguins. Who doesn't love that, right? Then in places where we have, say, some rivers, obviously you can do monitoring. Um, say, floods are important factors. A specialty use case um, of one of our partners is actually detecting when does the water run out of a stream because there's some really endangered fish in there, and there's you know, a few 10 specimens left, meaning that when the water runs out, they go there, pick up the fish, put them in a pond, and return them when that's the case. And this is really saving one species with IoT technology from extinction. Then in, say, dense forests, you can, for the first time, at a great real-time density, study the ecosystem and the animals and how the forest is actually growing back as it has been logged out and so forth. And in oceans, specifically water, we have animals swimming about. You know about the turtle project. We're working now on a project with IFREMER, a French marine organization, to track fish. And here we go more into details. How do you actually track fish underwater, especially with Laura One? Well, you don't, but you can still do quite a lot. Um, because we can place trackers on animals. They will swim underwater for a long while. And they need to pop off, swim to the surface. And we have a buoy somewhere in the ocean that is sending data. There, this has been done before. But again, LoRaWAN has the low power capacity, has the low cost capacity that this can be done at scale. So today, um, I would like to introduce the first prototype of the partnership between ourselves, Ifremer, the research organization, and Lacuna Space. Um, so we built this buoy as the first prototype that connects to Lacuna Space, and it has actually been sending data out from the uh, canal here in Amsterdam to the satellite that's hanging here um, for the past two days and measuring data. You can definitely come and have a look at this. But the idea of this project is not to create the world's best and most accurate wave height monitoring buoy. It is to create a cost-effective solution that can increase the data density. And LoRaWAN enables this very, very well. So if we look at the design, it's a standard mooring buoy. It's like a 5 or 7 euro buoy that you can buy in any marine shop. There's a pole there for the weight, so it's stable, and a box with electronics and sensors. It's really just that. But what we are specifically enabled with LoRaWAN is, hey, we put it here. We can send to the local LoRaWAN network, if there is one, with the same piece of hardware just a slight change in code, and actually you can do both at the same time, you can send to Lacuna Space. And that's way different from all the other solutions that have been out there, as you need special satellite modems and hardware, and that uses much more power. So the connectivity options in this really remote locations suddenly become much greater, much easier to implement. So we can look at this as Lower One Terrestrial, so put TTN everywhere. There's plenty of TTN gateways on remote islands, like even very high up places in Africa and all other locations. So that's becoming very much viable, because hardware is affordable, it works well, and it's easy to manage. For example, if you use the majority of other technologies available, especially mobile operator-based ones, there's a slim chance you will actually be able to do that uh, yourself. The other option, as mentioned, is using the Lacuna Space technology. So once the satellites are up, you can easily send data anywhere in the world. 
And the third option is a combination of imagination. And we can say put a gateway on drone. We've done that. We've shown that last year. We can put the gateway on a balloon and fly it up. Like Raspberry Pis being say, sent to space these days are quite a usual school project, really. So you could do that if you wanted. But what came up also on this conference, and this is something I really look forward to, is that we can use the repeater mode with standard LoRaWAN devices. And you can just have a teeter balloon. You can fly a drone up a few times a day. And you can really increase the coverage from some research stations and do cool things. So the use cases we have in mind are, um, especially correlated to water, we may have devices that are floating at the surface. And the, these are the usual cases. We have floating buoys. Um, as you've seen in the ocean a cleanup project, there's a need for a system like that. There's plenty of opportunities in terms of managing ports, having sensors, seeing what happens to the devices, and really connect every bit of kit that is floating out there. There's more advanced cases for studies, doing, say, drifter buoys that float around the oceans, collect the data. Um, and there's a few interesting cases of lost balloons, uh, trackers, and things that may end up in water. We may want to find them. So the unknown is, what range do we get out of flora if we put stuff in water? And let's see what happens. And then the question here is also, what happens to the usual devices, which are waterproof, but not designed specifically for water operation. And then we have underwater applications, such as we might have sensors in water that either float up or are below the tidal level. We can have trackers on animals that go swimming, that swim up and down like turtles, or other things. There's even a lot of buoy cases where they go up and down, and we collect measurements deep in the sea that way. There's even cases of, say, sounding balloons or other objects falling from the sky. And actually, if you look it up, every country launches a few sounding balloons every day, and they go up and they fall down. And there's quite a good hobby actually finding them, uh, if you happen to be interested in that. But the question is, if things end up in water, what range can we get from them if we use LoRaWAN? So above water, it's quite clear. It's line of sight. And actually, there's a really good workshop uh, that's been given on this conference on radio planning. You should check that out with Radio Mobile. Um, it's all posted open source um, on the GitHub. Um, so I suggest you check that out if you're particularly interested. But the real limits are line of sight and radio horizon, which is slightly longer. So we use like a best case here, Island of Reunion in Indian Ocean. It's an awesome island for a wireless network. There's a volcano 3,000 meters high. Like how? It doesn't get much better than that if you build a wireless network. But still, you will get a range of you know, a few hundred kilometers uh, from that. So what we can imagine in that case is if we have buoys with LoRaWAN on it, we can talk to the terrestrial network if we are around the island. Or if stuff floats around the island, it can talk to the terrestrial network. Otherwise, we have satellite options. And this is really amazing because it's just one piece of hardware that can do this. The underwater part gets quite interesting. So theoretically, we know what happens. Uh, we have water conductivity in micro Siemens per centimeter. And the more conductive the water is, the worse it is for radio waves. And the higher the frequency, the worse it is. So you can see there's plenty of technologies out there for submarines and other long-range communications at very low frequency. That works quite well underwater. But with uh, LoRaWAN specifically, we are usually in the 868, 915 megahertz, which is way too high for normal use in the water. But let's give it a go. Let's see what happens. So we decided to do the experiments, and we learned a few things. We put an antenna uh, in a waterproof box, much like uh, the one that's on the buoy here, and we've thrown it in the water. Let's see what happens. So we did these experiments in Freshwater River in Maribor in Slovenia. It was super cold, middle of the winter, but still good to do the experiments at this time. So we placed gateways next to the water on a building, say, 500 meters from the river, and also on a mountain about 10 kilometers line of sight, just to see what happens in that case. So we've done the experiments, put the antenna inside the case, uh, put it in water at the pressure sensor, so we see how deep you go and see what happens. So the results we got were, let's say, quite 
surprising and quite useful to an extent. Thus, at SF7, we managed to have successful transmissions um, down to half a meter below water. So we were doing this test multiple distances from uh, gateways. And you can see you can about 20, 30 centimeter coverage uh, if you're about 100 meters from uh, the gateway. Now, that might not be suitable for most LoRaWAN applications. But there are cases where you can have gateways on a boat or somewhere close, and the range is not uh, that great. On SF12, we actually got almost to 80 centimeters in this case. And with some optimizations, quite a bit more um, is available. We did the next experiment um, using a different antenna. So we actually took a normal antenna, you know, the one that sticks out of the box, and tried the same experiment. What we can see here is, because we are measuring the absolute depth of an object, that we get really good signal if we have an antenna sticking out of the water as we start sinking it down. So that's the beginning of the graph. But then it becomes actually much worse, because we have direct antenna to water interface, and the antenna is not tuned to that. Whereas in the other case, we have some air inside the actual box, and it does help. But we still see we get quite a bit um, of depth here. We repeated the experiment also in the sea. You can also see this buoy floating at the back. Um, unfortunately, we did not get many useful results from that, as the coverage is really just a few centimeters. So it doesn't look that promising uh, for seawater. But there's plenty of freshwater applications. So what we're thinking about and what we're loudly asking you all to approach us with are the ideas how we can use this technology where it was not primarily designed for, uh, and how we can work with that. We see the Things Network is deployed all around the world. There's plenty of locations. And as many speakers said today already, is if we're lacking the network, we ask our clients or partners to deploy the infrastructure. And if they're building a network, might as well build a public network. It's good for their use case, and it might be useful for someone else as well. But really, we want to be in the spaces, as Thomas from Lacuna said, that are outside the scope of normal gateways, and we normally see the network. And that gives us a good opportunity to do so. The projects we're working on at the moment, and we're really excited about, are the wave monitoring buoys. Um, so that's a really nice demo project to show the capability of this technology. But it's also like a starting point for something much more advanced we're developing, which are fish trackers for really large tuna fish that will be attached to the animals. They will swim around for a long time. Then it will pop off, swim to the surface, and start transmitting the data. So we'll get the data back from the animals, understand where they move, what they do. We will have a buoy that floats around the ocean, so we can track the temperature and the waves and gather data points that way. And if we're lucky, we can even retrieve it because we know where it's supposed to be. And this is something we're really, really excited in this year uh, to complete. And to wrap up, I would like to announce, uh, as last year, we are organizing the Things Conference on Tour in Maribor in Slovenia on October 2019. And you are all very welcome to attend. Uh, last year, was great. We had a blast. There were plenty of people in the area uh, that were interested about the technology. And we would like to promote this concept even further and really exchange experiences, ideas, and everything we can do together to create awesome solutions. Thank you very much. Feel free to get in touch.